So I, first time I saw a monk paintings in real life was in was in Oslo, and that was the that was the monk room there. It's all his best and well, most well known paintings, and it made an incredibly impression on me because I was also very young. I was like 17 or in that age, where especially that kind of emotional language speaks to you, you know, emotional existential language. Um, and then, like two years later, I was in Bergen, uh, and they have monk there too, and, and, I, and I saw this snow landscape, um, and I was completely unprepared. And I just looked at it, and, and you know, my eyes was filled with tears somehow. Uh, and it still can fill me without those paintings. It, there's such a loneliness in that painting, and it's, yeah, and I, it's really unexplainable because it's just a, f a f field with snow, but it has something to it, uh, such an existential depth, I think. Um, and it's so simple, and that's the thing he did in his best landscape, is the simplicity and, and charged with emotions. But I would never know if that's in the painting or if that's in me. But it's like his, his through that painting, he's, he's releasing something in his own self somehow. And when you see it, it's like the same, it, it, it's the same patterns and the same, it's almost like a song and it, and it released something in me. And I don't know if that's the same emotions but I, I think yeah I think it is I think if you see it that's what you feel you know and it's uh, yeah it's like a song it's it's uh, like a m very melodic painting uh, somehow it's with the lines and uh, yeah and the fields so this um, monk show is very much about showing an unknown side to Munch. Uh, almost all of the paintings I choose for it, uh, many haven't been shown. Many have been shown very seldom, uh, very rarely. Um, and I did that because, at least in Norway, Munch is such an iconic painter. So you have seen, you have already seen the paintings. So if you go to an exhibition, it's like, it's just a confirmation of what you already know, what you've already seen. And, I, and when I was uh, asked to, um, to do this exhibition, they took me down to the basement in the Munch Museum, uh, which have, I think, a thousand paintings. And they're kind of, um, you know, you pull out these huge, huge uh, plates with uh, different paintings on. And it was shocking to me because it was, it was everything was kept when he died, he donated this painting. So it's like it's, it's, it's a, a work in progress that is kind of frozen. And the way you saw it, it was like masterpieces, terrible, bad paintings, sketches, unfinished things. It was like everything was there. And the energy in that was, was great because you could see him working almost. So I, I wanted to have something of that in, in the exhibition. But then, you can't just throw things in, at least I know I'm, I'm a writer, so there has to be a little story. Uh, and, and, and I also remember being assigned for this uh, project. I came to the Munch Museum and I said, you know, do you have any idea of what you want to do? <laughs> and, and, I, and I thought this idea is so... I, I'm not a curator, you know, but so little and tiny and, and such a stupid thing. So I was almost too embarrassed to say to them, but then I finally I said, okay, there's a little story. And, it starts, um, uh, starts outside, outdoor, uh, landscape paintings, garden paintings. It's sunshine, it's people working in the garden, people bathing, swimming. It's, it's, and I did that, I think I started there because it's Jörn Munch is known as this gloomy death and sex and, and misery painter, which he also is, but then this side to him is also kind of unknown. And I thought, okay, I start outside in that world. Uh, and then that's the first room. And then you go into the next room, which is continues some of the same subject. So it's, it's still outdoors. It's still, uh, but it's, it's uh, emptying 
people, less and less people, and in the end it's completely frozen. So it's like just people are disappearing, and, and in the end it's something, and the, the atmosphere in that room is completely different, and it's very wild. Uh, I think it's very wild, uh, because he painted forests, the same forest for many, many years, and it's, it's, it's almost like some of them are not paintings, even, I mean, uh, of a forest, but just painting, and that's also an unknown side to him, and I, and I wanted to have that. Uh, and then the third room, so you have, you started outside in the harmonic world and then you go into something deeper and more um, uh, ambiguous and, and, and no people at all. And then you go in the third room, which is completely black. And I thought of that as the inner, inner space, the inner, so the inner forest. It's like, uh, it's also hard to see with painting what's inside and what's outside and what's internal and external when you look at the monk painting, for instance, because all his landscapes are uh, so charged with emotions. And I don't know why and how, but, but, it, but they are. Uh, so you go into that kind of chaotic state um, and there are many, many sketches and it's, it's uh, uh, I think it's a kind of heartbreaking room, really, uh, because it is in a state of chaos and despair and longing and uh, all kind of and jealousy and all kind of stuff uh, stuff are in there. But it's also very experimental. It's many things that is unfinished and some very interesting pieces he did. You know, one of his most famous paintings are Jealousy, and it's it's from 1890 something, and it's in his most famous period and when he became monk. But he painted that motif throughout his career, and then you have have some. It's like all everything is removed from it and but he kept the essence he kept the three faces and it's you can hardly see them but it's that's i think it's like three pictures in there and then you also have uh, people with no face it's all, all re recurring and it's it's really is unsettling and he did many many of those um, so being in the black chaotic room, you, you turn around and you go out and you come in a completely yellow room. Where is, we're back to the start. It's, but it's all people, it's all portraits, uh, life-size portraits, it's paintings. It's like coming out to a bunch of people, you know? Uh, that's the story. So you go from harmonic outside sunshine world into the forest deeper and deeper into the inner self and then out to all the people. And he, and he knew many of the people he painted. So it's like, a, those were his friends. The very last painting is a self-portrait. I've never seen it before. I think it must be like 25 or something. Uh, and it's kind of damaged a bit. And, uh, and also he hasn't painted half his face, isn't really painted. So it reminds you of the faceless people in there. And it's, it's, uh, the thought is that, okay, he, he did this. You have now seen, you know, that's the, that's the story. I think Munch was a very brave artist in many ways. Um, when he was educated as a painter in Oslo, which then was Christiania, uh, he was with a generation, you know, this, this was a talented painter in, in Norway, in the province of the world. And they all painted, they came from kind of national romantic paintings, uh, hair from Düsseldorf really, uh, and then uh, Christian Krog uh, come from Paris and, and taught them, and he was kind of a, a, a naturalist, uh, so it was all realistic, naturalistic painting, uh, and that was what Munch had, that was what he was taught, and that was his repertoire of, you know, to express himself, and then when he was in the very beginning of 20s, he, he started to paint uh, a painting called A Sick Girl, and he spent a year on it. Um, and he kind of, is, is, if you see it, it's kind of uh, layer upon layer upon layer. You can see was, he removed and he added and removed and added. It's like you could see the painting. It's very non realistic in a way. Uh, and what he wanted to do was to uh, paint his sister's death and his sister's deathbed. And it's a memory that he's, and it's like he's trying to dig. To get, to get to that memory. And it's completely raw, completely unfinished. Um, and unlike everything else at the time, you know, 
and he he and it wasn't unfinished to him. He exhibited it in a, in Oslo, in a kind of a saloon um, exhibition, and and people were laughing. I mean, they were they were laughing. They weren't even thinking it was ugly. They just thought it was a joke, you know. And to do that, you know, to have that strength to do that on your own, there's no reference to anything, is uh, I found incredible. Especially th those that, you know, there's no, there's no, like there's no many other painters doing the same thing. He's, he was on his own, and then he kind of found his style, maybe like ten years after that, and painted that for ten years. That's the monk. That's scream, and that's scream is also an incredibly radical. Painting, by the way, is easy to forget because we've seen it so many times. The scream, I think, is a bit, this is most famous painting, but it is also a bit different from the other paintings he did at that time. Uh, because in, in Scream and in Sick Girl, it's like the, 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 the room has broke down in a way. Uh, and in a realistic room, there is a distance. You, you look into it. It's like there is. It's happening somewhere else. It's, but it was like he was tearing down those, that room. So it's an, an immediate. It's an immediate scream. You know, it's his in the room. It's uh, incredibly powerful. But his his most famous paintings are more literary in 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 its. You know, it's like. Uh, his painting an episode, uh, there is a narration in it. It's um, um, and there's no, uh, there's not much, more like an illustration of an emotion is what he's doing really, or an illustration of a, of a memory. And it's all self-biographical. It takes everything from episodes in, in his own life. And it's, it's weird because it shouldn't be powerful because of that, because there is a distance in that too, you know. But if you see them, if you see them printed, it's okay. That's, you, I get it, he's jealous, I get it, he, he's full of melancholy. But if you see them in real life, they are very, very powerful still. And, but then he did that and, and, and was famous and, and, had, and had his style and he could have done that for the rest of his life. But he didn't, it changed and then, the last 40 years of his life, he painted differently, and, and it's not very known what he, what he was painting. And he was painting a lot of landscapes, and, and, and he painted almost every day, I think. He didn't have a life outside of painting, and he painted, you know, his, in his house, self-portraits in the garden outside, um, the rooms in the house, uh, the forest that was like, you know, 100 meters away. So it's like he painted his life somehow. Uh, and if you see that and if you go to those places, it feels like you are in a, in a kind of a novel, it's like Proust or something, it's like his life was painting. Um, and then there's a lot of not good stuff, I mean that's constant in his, in his career, that is not very good. And I'm not a painter so I can really not tell, I was very, very full of uh, fear when I had the ex exhibition because I, is this really good, is this bad, you know, I don't... I don't, I don't know what ma makes a painting good. I mean, you know it if you see it, but then you have those kind of in-between paintings that are interesting, but don't have that. They're not charged with emotions. I want that from paintings, but in this exhibition, a lot that don't have that, but I, I do find it, yeah, very interesting. And, and But anyway, if it's good or not good, it's, it's, um, it was very prolific and very, and it was constantly searching for something. Looks, uh, and he was experimenting, but not like, Cubists, or not like what was going on at the same time, but in other his own ways. Uh, so it was, yeah, it was, uh, yeah, I found him, found him very interesting. It was so fun to f also to see a kind of an aside to him that I really didn't know and just show that. It's hard to say what drove him really, um, but if you if you read his biography. It's, you can't, you know, avoid the fact that his mother died when he was very young and that Henry was very attached to his sister after that and then the sister died. Um, and he had a father that was kind of, I think, kind of dominant and difficult. And he had another sister who, who um, became mentally ill throughout his life. And then he had another brother who died when he was young too, not that young, but still. 
So his life was, was very much about death, really, when he, when he grew up. And I think, but I discussed that in my book about Munch, because you could see that, and then you could see a painting he did when he was like 22, you know, completely idyllic. It's all sunshine, and you could see he's a happy, he's a happy person, you know. It's, it's not like a constant thing, but I think it's deep in him, and I think, I think it's Sue Pridor, uh, one of his biographers, who, who talks about um, that your trust to the world disappears when something happens like that. You know, trust in people and trust in the world disappears. You can't trust because you can lose, you know. And probably Monk shut himself in, and he was very gifted. He, could, he was a very gifted drawer, and he, and he could paint, and that was his way of connecting with the world, I think. And, and, and there's two things with painting, I guess, if it's the same as writing. You can use it to kind of confront the world and confront yourself, but you can also use it to hide from it. It's a, it's a double thing, you know, you can just hide in literature and you can probably hide in painting too. And it's, it's very comforting in a way. It is even to create something that is painful, is comforting, just the act of creation. And I'm sure Monk must have had some of that in him, that, that painting was a place he could hide from the world. And at the same time, a place where he could get access to the world. And the brave thing he did was to confront all of that inner um, turmoils that he had in his paintings, as he did uh, in the 1890s when he was rather young. And then it was like, like his life was going faster and faster and faster, and he was drinking and he was getting paranoid and there was an episode with guns. and. And he tried to get away from women. I think he was very afraid of women or afraid to get a touch in a relationship just because he could lose them, you know. So there is, and there is a lot of sexuality and death and morbidity. And it's, it's, um, it's part of the times. I mean, it's decadent, it's end of century uh, time, but it's also in, also in him. And then he had, he had a, a completely breakdown uh, and he was in Copenhagen. Uh, in an institution, I think, I don't know how long, but for quite a long time. And when he got out from there and the rest of his life is different somehow, it's not like it's cut in two halves there, but it is, it is different. He, don't, he doesn't go inside anymore. He, he, he turns out to the outer world. So part of the reason the first painting in the exhibition is the sun, and, I, and I he'd painted that when he came back from Copenhagen, he bought a house in the southern part of Norway and he, he painted the sun, you know, it's, it's a new start, it's, it's a new day it's, and it's the world out there and I think it's, um, it's very symbolic to him as a painter, I think. Uh, and then I went also there to that house and you could actually see the place where he painted the sun. Uh, that's funny because it's such an iconic painting and then you don't connect that to some specific place, but yeah, you could stand there, you could see, oh, that's, that's where it is. I also went to Åsgårdstrand, which is his uh, summer house where he went every summer and painted, and uh, with uh, uh, Joachim Trier and his brother, so the filmmakers, and that was the same. Ah, oh, there's, you know, melancholy, there's this and there's that, you could see all the paintings just a hundred meters away from his house and it, those paintings feel so universal, you know, they're not specifically, that's where they are painted. I find it very hard to compare in any way myself with anyone else uh, of a certain, you know, what do you say, magnitude. <laughs> As an artist, uh, Munch is, is um, yeah, he's just contributed to, you know, the world, the history of, of art in the world. And, and he's a very, um, yeah, he's a great, he's a great artist. But when I wrote the book about him, I got questions afterwards. Who are you really writing about? Is it you or is it Monk? It's, you know, but that's because you can only read the world through yourself. So when I see Munch, I see him through the filter, which is my own writing and my own thinking. And, and, and then I might recognize something in him 
and then, I don't know if I'm projecting something into him or if it is real, you know, you can never know. And, and especially with paintings, it's very hard to, to know what's, what's coming from you and what's coming from the painting, really, in, in many cases. Um, um, but I, what I learned from him, uh, I think, the most... Uh, it's not as much as that as he painted it from his own life, and because that's part of the, the, the cultural history in Norway. I mean, and you have he came from a kind of bohemian circle where one of they had some ten commitments, and one of them is you should write your own life. You know, it's it's been there for 150 years now, so it's. That's not a radical thought, or that's, and I don't I have never, never thought about Munch in that sense. But when I started to work um, with his paintings and his exhibition, and reading about him and, and writing about him, and the thing I identified with, or wanted to identify with, was his carelessness in in the way he worked. Uh, he was careless with the paintings. He was, they were just out in the garden. They could be prints on the floor, people walking on it, and it didn't matter to him. Um, and also careless in the way he painted. He's, he, many paintings, he haven't bothered to fill it out, you know. It's, it's like it's, um, yeah, that's done. And well, maybe it's not good, but then the next one. Um, and I identify, I don't know if I identify with that to get away from a certain pressure, you know, it has to be so good. And, but when I started to write my struggle, that was the key to everything, was a lowered expectation completely. No expectations just write whatever I want and to see where it takes me. And there was such a freedom in that. Uh, and I think, yeah, that was, that was what I kind of identified with, with Munch. But uh, uh, Paul-Erik Teuner uh, wrote a book about Munch. Uh, and he has, you asked me earlier what, why, why he was driven or what drove him, but Teuner, writes about what he's looking for, what he think he's looking for. And there is a, it's a strange thing with his paintings is that he repainted so many motifs throughout his, his, uh, his career. I mean, Sick Girl, for instance, it was done and, and it is very much that painting because it's so thick with paintings and, and, and you know, as, as an object. But then he repainted it later, very different, but still the same motive and again and again. And he did so with all his, all his kind of major paintings. And it's like, why would he do that? There's no challenge. Is he copying himself? You know, is he lazy, or did he need money? Or, but Tainer has this, has this theory that he's looking for the iconic image, and when he finds the iconic image, the search is over. Then he can just paint it again and again and again. And it's, I think that's that sounds true to me. That is what he's looking for. Uh, you know. Um, the, mo the defining moment or defining place in the landscape or, or, or whatever, and then he can repaint it. And so it's not the painting in itself with, you know, the materiality of it. Uh, in that case, it's the, it's the image. So in a way, it's great to have a cup with a monk uh, motive because it's the iconic quality that comes through there. Having said that, in this later uh, life, he, he looked for many other things that is not that almost like the opposite of the iconic. It's, uh, it's much more about um, the, the problem with uh, having a strong style as a, as a painter is that you, uh, when you see it, that's what you see, you see the style. Uh, and it's, it's, and it's like, like, it's a great thing, but you, it's harder to see the actual paintings. Uh, and in this exhibition, I tried to to get to a place where you could see the paintings. And the important thing with radical paintings is that once they were radical, once there was, you know, what is this? Once they were kind of opening something up, have you come to them a hundred years later? It's not opening up anything. So, so Scream, for instance, is, yeah. But it's about anxiety and it's about a completely raw emotion, you know, and it's, it's so strong, but we don't have access to that, that anymore. So the, 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 the black room in the exhibition is, I try to, if I have, you know, like, I don't know how many paintings in there, maybe 30 paintings, to try to express that emotion through 30 other paintings, 
that was what I tried to do, you know, to, to get access to the same kind of feeling and rawness and openness that he had in, in the scream. But one thing about that room that I didn't say is that it has, has a, the, the theme of the forest goes in and it's like the inner, the inner forest, um, to be a bit uh, silly, but then there is the materiality of the forest is in that room too, because he was uh, in, in the prints where it's like the, and the woodcuts, it's like the wood and, and the materiality of the forest comes out in, in, in the print. So it's like, it's, it's um, yeah. I think I found it, it was hard to write about Monk to find a way in. What I wanted to do was kind of, um, not only read the paintings or, uh, you know, analyze them or I wanted to kind of, to get, see where they came from and what his perspective was when he was painting them. And then I read this uh, wonderful uh, Gilles Deleuze book about Francis Bacon. And he has kind of a formula there, or, a, or a, he, he talks about the painting before the painting. And that was, that was the moment of, then I, I could, could start to write about him, because that's true for writing as well, of course. Uh, there is, we have a lot of, what do you call it, presuppositions, um, whatever it's called, uh, things that are there beforehand. For Munch, that's, that's a crucial thing. I mean, what was there before he was painting his sister, for instance? Uh, how, yeah, there were many, many paintings of girls, sick girls in a room. Uh, that was present for him. And that's what you, you know, that's what you use. Uh, and you have also a lot of cliches before. If you paint a tree, there's so many ways to do it, you know, and it's, it's like uh, you have to remove all of that stuff to be able to paint your own tree, you know. Um, there is a brilliant poem in, in, from Ola Hauge, he's, he's a Norwegian poet, uh, uh, he's dead now. Uh, the, he's so very simple, he said, many people have painted an oak, still Munch painted an oak. That says it all, you know, I think, not all, but <laughs> it's, it's, it's a, it's, it's a, you can't get away from that. What's there before? You can you can remove the most obvious, but you can. This is, the law says you have to go through all of that and, and get a painting on the other side, uh, and it's true in in writing about as well, and it's true in reading. I mean, uh, when I was in my twenties, I worked as a literary critic, and and I've and you know, I have. I'm very, very sure of my own taste and my own, you know, what was good and what was bad and uh, not a problem to kind of, you know, axe a book by a writer that was like 60 and, and great and but I was, I was 20, I, I did that and, and late, many years later I started to think why, what was, what was the, what was the, uh, the reasoning behind, I never turned the, the, the gaze inwards and looked, why? What is the criteria for those? I mean, you got the criteria for the book and for the art, but not for the critics. It's like it's invisible. It's, it goes without saying, you know? And that is the fact when you write uh, fiction also. You have a lot of criteria that this is good and this is good because of that. And, and, and some of those criteria are just say, um, um, they, you don't question them because that's just the fact, it's the truth, that's, that's how you do things, you know. So Schilderlöf here also writes about, that was something that was very important to me when I was in my beginning of my twenties. I you know, underlined it when I saw it, it was a Danish magazine, I read it, literary magazine, and his is very simple, but he said a form isn't something you kind of have and put over something and, and then it's, and, and then it's, then it's, uh, then it's a book, a, for, a form is, is something unfinished and, and something in the beginning uh, that kind of 
match the world somehow, which also is unfinished and always beginning. Uh, and it's it's to, to get to that point where things starts uh, that is crucial to get to when you are making something. So if something is prepared, a form is prepared, then it will be just something in the past that is kind of fixed. Uh, if you want to get to the moment, or if you want to get to, to what's going on, then you need, you, you need a form that's not fixed somehow. And if you do that, try to do that, you have to break down. You know, that was what Monk was doing, he broke things down. Uh, but that's a form, and if you do that, for, repeat that form, then that would be something stale and something uh, unflexible and something that's not responding to what's around you, but just something from the past. Um, and in, in Monk's career, you could see that that was the thing that happened to him. He, he got somehow stuck in a certain style. He got stuck in himself. He got stuck in Monk. Um, and it's, it's there throughout his life, but you could see his, his many ways, try to avoid it, try to get to new places, try to, all around his house, that is. But still, uh, that's what he's doing, and you have to do that. I mean, to repeat yourself, that's, he did that, uh, of course, but still that's the, um, that's the threat you have as, as an artist. And also, because I guess I'm not a painter, but I guess painting is also about discovery, you know? And if you know, then you don't discover anything, then you produce and reproduce. So this is kind of, I think this is a essence of, of creativity of that process is in, in, in art has to do with this. And, and Sheila Lewis writes very much about it and very, very good about it. And, and yeah, it's very meaningful to me. And it was also very meaningful when I, when I wrote about Monk. It's also a matter of losing control, isn't it? Yes, yeah, very much that. Uh, because control is also something that is exist before, you know. Uh, it's, it's a pattern, it's something you... you and, and we have to have that in our lives, of course, and control things and define things, and, and, but in art you have to let go somehow. And it's, uh, that's where the braveness comes in, because if you do, you don't know what this is, if it could be crap, and it often is crap, you know, and, but you just have to let go. And it's, it's um, the hardest thing, it's not to get a, uh, you know, someone criticizing your work. The worst thing is that people laugh at you. You know, that's the worst thing. Like Monk, he invested a year, he invested everything he, he knew and, and he invested his, his, his innermost feelings and sorrow for his sister and then people are laughing, can you imagine? But he was very arrogant as well and, and very self-confident and, and, but still it's, it's um, that's what you risk it doesn't sound like a big risk, but it, but it is. Cabbage Field is, is a, a minor painting in, in Monk's, uh, you know, over it's, um, it's just a cabbage field. It's, it's a cabbage field that he painted just outside his house. Um, and it's very simple. It's, uh, it has it's green and yellow and cabbage kind of going towards um, a night sky or, or it's uh, dusk. Um, but that's one of the paintings I really... Uh, uh, when I worked with, with all these paintings that I was the most attached to, one of the most, the most attached to somehow. Uh, it's a, a bit like the same, like the um, snowfield in, in, uh, in Germany, the other one we talked about. Um, but it has a different aura. It's, when I see it, I, I think of death somehow. Um, and I don't know why that is. Uh, the book opens with that. <laughs> what is this? Because it's so simple and it's really is nothing much, but it still is incredibly charged, I think. Um, it's almost like seeing the world after when you're not there. And that thought is, you can have that some times in life, I think I've had that, where you really understand that. And that's death, you know, that's 
not there anymore, but the world will still be there. And it's like, it's like it's seen, uh, seen through that. And I think it was, it was around 50 when he painted it. So it's, it's a midlife painting, but I, but I, I have no idea if, if that, probably that was just a cabbage really painted, but it's, it's, a, it's a masterful painting, I think, because it's so simple and it's almost nothing there. It's still incredibly meaningful. If I, as a writer, wrote what I thought, what I thought, and put it in a book, it would be uninterested and it would be dated and it would be very restricted. But the thing is that the writer has to do, and it's, it's, I'm not saying I'm doing it, but, but that's what writers has to do is to, um, it, it, you must, um, it must be, the, most, the, the tensions and, and, and um, emotions and uh, contradictions and, you know, everything has to be in the book and it has to be, and it will be released by the reader. And it has nothing to do with me. It's in the book. I, I, I just reread Flaubert and Madame Bovary, you know, and it's, it's, uh, it's an incredibly good book, but that's why it's not, I mean, uh, Flaubert invests everything he has, every emotion he has is invested in the book, but it's not him. It's kind of put to a, to a, a rather stupid woman, you know, and a rather stupid husband and a rather stupid, those persons are filled with this. And it's not, it's like they're on their own, all those emotions. Uh, and, and then they come alive every time you read it. But if you read what Flaubert did before, he, he filled it with himself and it's unreadable, you know, it's like, don't really, you can't really do that. And, and I think for Munch, it's, um, that's why he also, I think, got better in a way throughout his life because he, he uh, through that simplicity, he managed to, to accomplish that even, you know, without people, even almost without nothing. It's, that's, I guess that's what painters do, but I, I don't know. Uh, but I, I think, yeah. Um, and a painting is nothing in itself. I mean, it's just some colors and it's, of course, it has to be released and it has to be part of someone else's inner life somehow. And, and it's, that's where it's, it's living. And Monk is dead, like, uh, 80 years ago, and, and we don't know what he thought when he painted it. It's like, but he, and it's also about, you know, it, it's about kind of a, yeah, communication. It's, it's for us. Uh, and if it's, um, yeah, it has to, yeah, even if you're breaking down all expectations, there must be something left, you know, for us. Uh, and in, in Munch's case, and in the best painters from that period, they still, you know, they still, they, they work. We can go and see an exhibition with those paintings and they work for us. Uh, it's very interesting how that's possible, but, uh, but when it's not possible, you see it at once, you know, when it's, when it's dead. Mm -hmm.